I made a lot of mistakes, but I didn't give up. I would tell you that's probably the thing more than anything else that, that made me successful with my team was the fact that I didn't stop. I didn't say, forget about it. This doesn't work. And I've seen yeah. far too many agents, you know, they say, oh, they get all pumped. They're going to start a team. They're going to hire some people. They hire some people. They're not the right people. They don't have nearly the same work ethic as they do. They don't, they're not committed. They get frustrated and they just say, this doesn't work. And then they just say, forget about it. I would say the difference between me is I just kept, kept say, okay, this person's not, you know, clearly they, they are not, they're not motivated. So I'm going to go find someone else. They're not motivated. Okay. I'll find someone else. So now I realize, okay, I got a motivated person, but you know what? I'm just really not that great of a leader. So now I got to work on my, my leadership skills and I got to become a better leader and I got to learn how to understand people and what their goals are and how to help people. Even if you find somebody that's motivated, you can unmotivate them finding the right people, but then also being the right leader. David, thank you for being on the show. I appreciate you joining us here. Uh, very cool to have you on. I'm excited to talk to you. Yeah, man. Thanks. It's an honor to be here. Appreciate you inviting me. Awesome. For sure. Now let's, let's give people a better sense. Obviously we, we gave them some of the highlights in the beginning, but let's give them a better sense of who you are, what your background is, um, how you got into all the things you're into. Like how did, where did you start and what got you into this world now? And, and how did you kind of find your way uh, into this uh, sales, you know, sales guru, sales master, sales expert. How did you become that? Yeah, man. Thanks for um, asking. I started literally, I, I, I remember, I'm going to go way back. So as a, as a 17 year old, I saw an ad that said, basically make a ton of money uh, working part-time. It was like, I don't know, it was like a hundred thousand dollars and Back, you know, at that, that was like a billionaire, right? When you're, yeah. when you're 17, making a hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> exactly. uh, exactly. um, so anyway, I called and they, they said, okay, come on down. And I ended up going to this um, little call center at Webster square, Worcester mass. And uh, that was where it all started. I, I ended up calling for, uh, they had Kurt, it was a Kirby vacuum cleaner call center. So basically what I would do is I would, I would literally just call the list they gave me and they gave me a script and, call and try to set up appointments for people to have somebody come to their house and give them a demonstration on this uh, $1,500 vacuum cleaner back then. And that's where it all started, you know, and I started there and I did that for a while and I was somewhat effective with it. I, I didn't love it. Honestly, I ended up going and working for um, uh, it's, it's now chase years back then it was MBNA America bank credit card company. Okay. That was when it, that was when it was legal to take credit card applications over the phone. Okay. or to get people to agree to it. So I was calling a lot of people and same thing, list, script. Um, I had a ton of success with that. Um, but I'll tell you, I, I honestly, I was there for, I don't know, about a year and I did not feel, I don't know, I just felt like some of the people that were agreeing to take applications, it didn't feel right. You know what I mean? It just, although they were saying yes and I was raising my hand and they were coming over and the guy was closing, it just didn't feel right. So I left, I went into publishing and uh, I went to work for a magazine in 2000, uh, I'm sorry, 1986 or something. I don't know, going way back. <laughs> and I sold advertising. That's how I, I, you know, literally called telephone books. I called uh, other trade magazines. I went door to door. I went business to business. Um, you know, I had accounts like back in the day, I had AT&T, Verizon, Sherwin Williams. I mean, I, I would go to these big companies and, you know, get into their media departments and that uh, just cold call and and get them a media kit. And I, so I, that's where I started. And in 2002, uh, one day, my seven year old daughter, uh, I'm sorry, 10 year old daughter, my daughter, Jacqueline back then came home one day and said, Hey mom, mom's friend, Amy makes a ton of money selling real estate. You should get a real estate license. I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> Went to bed that night, next morning, awesome. woke up. First thing on my mind was, Hey, I should look at getting my real estate license. Got my real estate license and, uh, you know, the rest is history, man. Listed seven homes my first month with four sale by owners, built a team, closing over 100 houses. We were doing 95 to 110 houses a year for years. Became a Keller Williams team leader. So I recruited a couple hundred agents into KW and 
actually recruited for Gary Keller personally my last seven months at KW. I worked with Gary calling independent brokerages around the country. And uh, then I just, uh, for, for a lot of different reasons, I chose to leave um, Keller Williams and now I'm at uh, EXP and um, love it. And here we are today. So that kind of gave you everything, right? No, that's good, man. So yeah. was your daughter 10 when she suggested that you go into be a real, be a, a realtor? Is that? Yeah. 10? Yeah. 10. So she's 27 now. So I've been in real wow. estate just around 18 does years. Does she know yeah, what an impact that you, she had on your trajectory? I mean, she, does she aware that she started that? Um, yeah, I've told her many times. She just smiles. <laughs> I can't get her to jump into real estate, which she would, she would be amazing, but she yeah. does, doesn't want anything to do with it. She's a school teacher, okay. likes being a school teacher and yep. Yeah, I so a, yeah, I got a daughter the same age as school teacher, same thing. It's yeah. funny. That's that's awesome. So, how much of your sales skill, how much of the the you know sharpening that sales knife, do you attribute to those early years, beating the bushes, cold calling, door knocking, all that kind of stuff? How much did you learn in that time? I would say I learned resilience. I'm not I'm not sure there was it was I wouldn't tell you there was this great training program because there really wasn't. It was yeah. like here's here's your script and just make as many contacts as you can and you'll find somebody. Um, but it, 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 it created resilience and it also, you know, it, it helped me um, uh, be able to deal with a lot of rejection to not let things like that take it, take, you know, me take that stuff personal. And it's helped me over the years. I mean, you know, it's a, I wrote a lot about it in my book and in chapter three, we talk about call reluctance and, you know, I think that's an area that's probably helped me more than anything else is just the ability to, um, in sales, not take things personally, mm -hmm. um, just go into it from a place of, uh, listen, I'm just trying to help you to achieve whatever goal you have. Um, it, sometimes I can do that. Other times I can't. And if I can't, then, hey, I, I, you know, that, that's, that's it. I'm going to move on to someone else that I can help. And I think it took years to get to that place. Yeah. Yeah. But um, I think it all started, you know, uh, when I was young. And I think that's one of the biggest mistakes I see with a lot of salespeople um, is, you know, they're so worried about, um, you know, fear of call reluctance or fear of rejection, or they don't want to say the wrong thing or they're so they, they need to look, be right and look yeah. right. And I think that's, that's a mistake that a lot of salespeople make. So is, is uh, what did you call call reluctance? Is that, is that basically the, the resisting the need to, to make those calls. Is that what it is? Or like, I know you talked about thick skin and kind of that don't take it personally, but what is the yeah. reluctance part? Yeah, I think, I mean, call reluctance is just, it's, it's what we call the, the, it's really a mindset, right? It's, 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 I, it's not a tangible thing. It's more of a, it's like the mindset. So I have, you know, I know in the morning that if I want to be successful, all maybe all I need to do is talk to five people today. But yet my mindset's going to tell me, uh, oh, that little voice that we all have, you know, the little voice, everybody oh, listening the to the, voice, the yeah. little voice that just said, hey, what's that, what little voice that, you know, that little voice. So, but the reality is we all, we psych ourselves out so much like, oh my God, well, what if I say the same thing? Or, 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 or what if I don't know what to say, right, is, is a form of car reluctance or you know, there's, there's also fear of rejection or, or, you know, well, geez, I, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't want to get rejected and, and, uh, you know, I don't, I don't, you know, like, it's just that, that, that mental, uh, geez, I'm trying to think of the right words for it. It's just, it's just that what we, we do it to ourselves, you know, we're so yeah. concerned with not being, you know, right or not looking good. And another form of car reluctance, frankly, is, is fear of, of um, success. I mean, yeah. you know, sometimes people do things and you have success at it. And maybe it was a lot harder than you thought. And like, oh my gosh, I don't want to have to do that again. So you, yeah. you kind of stop, you put the brakes on. Um, fear of rejection is the biggest by far. Um, there's lack of role acceptance is another one. You know, somebody has their MBA, um, yet they're cold calling and they're thinking like, geez, I, I, you know, I, I went to college, I, I've got a yeah. you know, degree here, but yet I'm calling freaking for sale by owners or I'm calling, you know, homeowners to see if they'd be interested in selling their house. Like this is, this is below me. I mean, that, that's another example of car reluctance. So this, it's, it's a mental thing yeah. is really what it is. Yeah. Yeah. So it, <laughs> this may be a weird question, but do you think that salespeople are, are born or are they created? Can you become a great salesperson if that's not something that you have any background or maybe it's not your natural tendency, someone who's a reluctant salesperson, can they be great? Or do you think it's just you're, you kind of are born with it or you're not? 
Uh, it's a good question, Mike. Um, I would say, I would, so from my experience, and I've, I've brought a lot of good salespeople into, into the real estate world and a lot of really, really highly successful people. And I've also brought in a lot of people that, that failed, that weren't able to do it. And so what I've learned over the years is the P, I, I don't know that you're born a salesperson or not. I wouldn't say it's, it's not like, you know, you have a baby and, and I, think, I think I heard Zig Ziglar say this years ago, like, oh my God, I've had a listing specialist, right? It's, <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's, yeah. a, that's a joke in real estate, but it's, it, it, <laughs> I, think, I think it's, um, it's really a matter of, are you willing to, to, uh, to get, you know, outside of your, your thoughts, be comfortable um, and just do some of the things that are, that I'm sorry, be uncomfortable is what I meant yeah, to say. Yeah. And do some of the things that, because in sales, if you're going to be good at sales, you have to be proactive in some capacity, right. you know, unless you're just, uh, uh, you know, somebody that just deals with incoming calls. And sometimes that's fine. But in, in real estate, um, in wholesaling, which is something we're looking at, you know, now um, you have to be calling people. You have to be talking to people. You have to be reaching yeah. out to people. Yeah. And a lot of times you're reaching out to people that, you know, they're not sitting there waiting for you to call. They may be doing something else. You're, as a matter of fact, a lot of times we're in interruption. So we really have to be on point. So to go back to your question, I would say it's, it's conditioning. Um, but you need somebody mentally tough. And, and, you know, going back to the car reluctance thing, I think it's really important that if you're the type of person that can't get beyond your own ego and beyond you not looking good and you being right all the time, I think you're going to struggle in sales. I'm not the type that's going to say, well, you've got this great personality and that's why you're great at sales. Because I know a lot of salespeople that are phenomenal salespeople and frankly don't have really good, big personalities at all. You <laughs> yeah. know what I mean? But they're really, yeah, good, yeah. really good at sales because they're purposeful yeah. about it. Yep. Yeah. I, I have found, you mentioned a couple of times like fear of this and fear of that. What I've noticed about the salespeople that I've been around that are really good is they're not afraid of rejection. They're not yeah. afraid of some, you know, there's a guy that my partner in my business, he always says one of the best things about uh, good salespeople is they're not afraid of being uncomfortable. And mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, for us, I, we do a lot of wholesaling. You mentioned that you guys are looking at it now. We do a lot of wholesaling. So sometimes we're in the home and, and we have to, you know, eventually you've got to kind of tell them what it is you could pay for their house or what you're willing to pay. Yeah. And it's usually lower than what they were kind of hoping. And that's an uncomfortable thing to say. So his, his thing is I make more money by just letting there be very uncomfortable, awkward silence and letting wait until they talk, tell them yeah. what you have to tell them and just, and just be quiet and wait. And people's tendency is to fill, you know, that dead space, sure. to fill that empty space. And he's like, I've sat there for what felt like minutes just waiting and the silence is horrible, but a good salesperson realizes that and they can do it. Right. And a lot of, most people just can't, they're just like, Oh my gosh, that was so uncomfortable. I don't ever want to do that again. I, I mean, I, when I started my company, I, I had to do sales cause I was the only person in the company and I was adequate. I was okay. Like at best. <laughs> so I wasn't that great. It wasn't until I brought in a really good salesperson that I realized the difference between adequate, okay. And really good is tremendous. And there's a lot of difference in the revenue when you have a really good salesperson. Oh, um, so it made me realize and, and really respect the difference of having really good salespeople as opposed to people who are doing it because they kind of have to, you know, which was what yeah. I was doing, even as the owner of the company, I had to do it, wasn't great at it. So that, that all being said, um, what is it about when you were building your, your brokerage, when you were building that and you were kind of growing, what, what do you think? Cause I, I've talked to people who tried to build, you know, a team and it just didn't work. Like, yeah. what do you think you did well that allowed you to build that team and have that success early on? <laughs> it's going to sound interesting. Uh, I would say I, you know, I, a lot of, a lot of failure, man, a lot, a lot of, um, you know, a lot of people coming and going. I made a lot of mistakes, but I didn't give up. I would tell you that's probably the thing more than anything else that, that made me successful with my team was the fact that I didn't stop. I didn't say, forget about it. This doesn't work. And I've seen yeah. far too many agents, you know, they say, oh, they get all pumped. They're going to start a team. They're going to hire some people. They hire some people. They're not the right people. 
They don't have nearly the same work ethic as they do. They don't, they're not committed. They get frustrated and they just say, this doesn't work. And then they just say, forget about it. And they don't yep. build it. And I would say the difference between me is I just kept, kept say, okay, this person's not, you know, clearly they, they don't not, they're not motivated. So I'm going to go find someone else. They're not motivated. Okay. I'll find someone else. So now I realize, okay, I got a motivated person, but you know what? I'm just really not that great of a leader. So now I got to work on my, my leadership skills and I got to become a better leader and I got to learn how to understand people and what their goals are and how to help people to, you know, to, to, to not just, even if you find somebody that's motivated, you can unmotivate them, frankly. Yeah. And I, I've done that in the past too. So I think there's a lot of, a lot of yeah. things, Mike, I think it's, it's finding the right people, but then also being, the, being the right leader. Um, yeah. You know, and I think that, that, that's going to be the key to, to that, to, you know, to I, I building totally a good agree. team. Yeah, I totally agree. Like you can get really good at whatever it is it takes to start and launch your business. But as soon as you start bringing people on, you, you kind of sometimes go from being the person doing the work to the person leading, training, motivating, like you said, and being a really great, you know, realtor, a, a great salesperson in any capacity doesn't necessarily make you a great leader. You know? No, not it's even like a close. Skill you have to, you have to then acquire and, and that skill. And I think, you know, people put a lot of time and energy into learning to be great at the operation side of it, like the, the technician side of it. And then, like you said, I've done the same thing. I brought people in that were motivated and I've crushed them because I was sort of jerky to work for. I didn't mean to be, but yeah. I just thought like, you know, go do it, man. I'm paying you like, go get it. Right. And it's like, not everyone's motivated by that kind of, that kind of motivation. So it's just like kids, right? You have kids, each yeah. of your kids are probably motivated differently. They have things that you can and can't do to make them feel like they want to do something. So it's just learning those skills as a leader is a whole different ball game. So, so true. Absolutely. I'm glad you said that. Cause that's a great point. I think people forget it. You know, like for me, just tell me what you want and I'll do it. And some people yeah. need to be shown more of that. And some people need to be led a little bit more than that. So that's huge. That's really huge. So you mentioned, and you, you, you held up for a second, your book, uh, the sales playbook, what made you want to write a book? Why, why write a book and why write that book? Um, yeah, it was an idea I had for years and, uh, frankly, I just hadn't got around to it. And finally I, a friend of mine is uh, Jarek Robbins is a, is a good friend of mine. It's Tony's youngest son and you know, him and I coached for a little bit and he, you know, just talking to him, it was one of the things that was there that I had not, um, uh, you know, uh, implement. It was one of the things I just wasn't, wasn't doing. I, I'd write a little bit and then I, I would stop, wouldn't write again for months. Right. Yeah. So he actually, Jarek wrote a book called Live It, which is a fantastic book, by the way. And he set me up with his uh, ghostwriter. He ghost wrote his book. And ultimately hiring that ghostwriter and, you know, and, and writing that big check was, was what helped me finish the book. You know? And the reason why I wrote the book is because it's, it's all the things we've talked about today. It's everything that's helped me to become successful and my, my purpose in life. And again, this comes from coaching with Jarek is, uh, is inspiring, inspiring millions. You know, that, yeah. that's my, my vision to, uh, you know, I inspire people by sharing powerful life experiences. So what I can do is share all the experiences I've had. And if that can help somebody and in many, many ways it can, then I can help you become a better person or a better version of yourself. So yeah. the writing the book was, was giving my blueprint on, Hey, here's 11 strategies so that you can become more effective at sales. And that's, that's ultimately what the book's about. And, you know, yeah. and now as we talked about earlier, um, I'm doing a rewrite. I just bought it back from the publisher. So it's not even on Amazon right now. They took it down. And we're doing some rework. So I'm, uh, I'd say about 30 days, it'll be back up on Amazon with a 2.0 okay. version with a new chapter. And I'm super, super excited about that. And I own the right, so I can do whatever I want with it. I can <laughs> share it. chapters. Yeah. I can do all kinds of really cool stuff it, now that I could It's good to own do. your own work for sure. And yeah, by the way, yeah. when you're saying 30 days from now, as you're listening to this, it is on Amazon guys. So thank you. So there's my this. accountability right there too. Now I love that. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's yeah, right, man. So, People are going to be looking for it. The sales playbook um, so make sure you check that out. David Hill, the sale, the sales playbook. Um, okay. So let's talk about this. You, you, uh, in my notes here, uh, you talk about the, the hidden gold mine in your pocket. What is the hidden gold mine in your pocket? What does that mean? 
Yeah, it's it's uh, well with the the uh, the context of it for the book is this is is we're talking about this thing right here, right? The cell the phone. phone. Yep. Yes. Yeah, so that is the hidden gold mine in your pocket, and most people um, aren't going to pick it up and and be proactive with it. So that in the context of what you just said. Um, there's another gold mine though, is, is it's not just the phone, but it's, it's, uh, it's all these, see this right here. When you, I want everybody to go into your phone and go to your, your contacts list. And then what I want you to do is I want you to click on the contacts button and then you can scroll all the way to the bottom. So everybody do this right now, pick up your phone, hit contacts and just keep scrolling all the way, all the way, just like this. Now, what does that say at the bottom? Mine says 5,972. What does yours say? Jeepers, creepers, not that. It says 658. Okay, great. So you have 658. Mine are probably a lot of weird stuff and all <laughs> these people I've talked to over the years that I just put their number in the phone or yep. cab ride, Cabo, whatever, all kinds of weird <laughs> stuff, right? But the reality is those are that's the gold mine. All those people, and I'm and I'm out of these people here, I, I probably have relationships with at least a thousand of them. Yeah. Half yeah. of them I haven't talked to in ages. Right. So going back and, and, and getting those conversations started again, checking in with those guys. Yeah. How the heck are you, man? How you been? Jeez, I haven't talked to you in years. What are you doing? Right. Right. right? How can I help you? Like, what do you, what do you, what business are you in now? What can I do to help you? Right. Wow. That's awesome. I mean, it's, that's, that's it. Huge. It's that simple. It doesn't have to be any more complicated than that. Like, Oh, Hey, I got my license. Do you want to want to hire me for real estate? No, you just, you don't need to even say that stuff anymore. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's, it's so true. It's, it's such a powerful thing. People use it to, you know, play angry birds or whatever, candy crush. And it's like, you're right. It's right there. And it's, it's something that people are constantly have their face in They're constantly have their eyes on. So, so for, many people hide behind text these days too, man. It's uh, yeah. It's, it's, so you're, uh, you're saying you're calling them like you're actually like calling. Them. Yeah. I, I call a lot. I, I do text as well. And I also do a lot with uh, Facebook now. So we're doing yeah. more of that, just being proactive. But I think a lot of people do hide behind text. Just yeah. I think text, uh, I think the best, the best form of, you know, communication is, is like, per, you know, me sitting across from you live, but I would say yeah. this right here is the second best, yeah. right? Because we can see each other. Yeah. Right. I can, I can see your, you know, your expressions. I can see, I can really, pay attention to your, your facial gestures, everything. The next is going to be the telephone because we have the, ver the you know, the verbal, the, the audio, sure. we can, we can hear those intricacies. Text, yeah. you're not getting any of that at all. And the same thing with email, right? It's, as a matter of fact, text is even worse because it's so short. And then what happens is our interpretation of what they're saying comes yeah. into play. So if I just had an argument with, I don't know, maybe my wife and I just had a disagreement or something. And then all of a sudden I get a text from somebody that sh that can show up in a way I perceive yeah. that or read that text. Yep. Yeah. And it's funny people, you mentioned the, the shortness of text. It, you know, my, I have daughters and, and one son, but I, my daughters will text me something like, Hey dad, you know, you should do this or whatever. Like, Hey, this is, and I'll write back. I'll just write the letter K and hit send. Cause I hate texting. Mm. And they'll be like, next time they see me, they'll be like, why, what were you mad about? I was like, what are yeah, you yeah, yeah. mad? Well, you just wrote K. Like that sounds yeah. like you're mad. It's like, it's just the interpretation. Cause you need emojis little, and yeah. <laughs> yeah. You need emojis. And it's like, yeah, uh, it's, I, I am not trying to be rude, but I'm, telling I'm not you, a I'm great texter. Type the letter K. I'm going to do it again. So just know I'm not mad. Well, um, you know what, Mike? So in, that's a great point. So set those expectations ahead of yeah. time, you know? Yeah. So, Hey, here's how I, Cause I'm the same as you. I, I like to, as short as possible, but I let people know, Hey, listen, this isn't personal. Yeah. I care about you. Um, it's, it's just efficiency. That's it. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. you know, and, and yeah, I think that's great. Very cool. You, you mentioned getting into wholesaling. I'm just curious. What, yeah. why, why do you want to do that? What's the, cause you're, you're still, you have your brokerage with EXP you mentioned. Um, yeah. and for me as a wholesaler, <clears throat> it's, it's sort of the anti, realtor route. It's, it's, you know, a, a lot of realtors aren't huge fan of wholesalers because they feel like they're taking some of their business. So how do you marry those two? And why did you decide to become a wholesaler or have that in your arsenal? Yeah, I, I would say um, I've always been a, 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 a realtor that has been a, uh, I've always adapted to what's happening in the market. And I think that there's going to be a change 
Um, in 2008 and nine, I was doing REO business. We, we killed it with REO. As soon as the market shifted, we start, I started contacting banks. I started, you know, getting in with these asset companies and it, it, and it was huge. And then we went into short sales in 2010, 11, I was the number one short sale guy in my area. Um, and I just feel like um, wholesaling is, is probably going to be uh, one of the next uh, shifts, I think, in real estate or evolutions. And the other thing is, you know, I think there's, uh, if, you, if you follow what's happening now, and call me crazy because nobody's really talking about this, but there are uh, millions of people right now that are, that are three months behind on their mortgages. There's millions of people that are filing for unemployment. I, I, I could be wrong, but I hear like weekly. No, so the, the, the thing is, everybody's focusing on right this moment. Yes, right this moment, inventory is low. Houses are selling as soon as you put it on the market. The, the challenge with everything that's happening now is in real estate, it's a lag. What's happening now shows up a year from now. Yep. So that's part of the reason um, I like wholesaling. And another part of the reason, I think it's a fantastic model. I, I wish I, I, took a, I took a course last year. Um, I paid somebody $2,500 to teach me how to wholesale. I went, it was, it was effective. It was cool. But then I, then I took a course with uh, Kent Clothier. I'm sure you know who he is. And then he showed me the real way to do it, um, <laughs> which was, which was actually a smart, because the first time I learned, what I learned was I went and I found all these potential sellers and then I had to go find a buyer. Clint was, Clint, uh, Kent was the opposite. Yeah. And you may, maybe you, you have yeah. something else to add to this, but Kent said, no, what you want to do is you want to find the, the buyers first, the cash buyers, then identify the areas they want to be in, what they want, and then go find the properties for them. Yep. And um, to me, that, that just makes a lot more sense. That's awesome. That's that whole nope. Memphis Invest model, right? That's his, I believe, the company he's, a fo he's associated with his family. He's R so. R E W W Real okay. Estate uh, Worldwide. Gotcha. Yeah, he's a, he's a, he does a lot with that, with that training and stuff. So that's so, good. It's good. Yeah, yeah, it's totally good. Is that the, uh, so is the approach, I'm just trying to understand logistically here. Do you go into a home as a realtor and downshift to like, hey, this isn't going to make sense for me to list, maybe deferred maintenance, whatever the problem. And then, oh, we also have this solution. Yeah. Is that, is that so, kind of the so, model? So here's something really cool that a lot of people don't realize yet is um, there, the, there's three, three large companies out there right now that do iBuyer. Um, Zillow, uh, offer, what's your one? OfferPad. There's three. I can't remember the top three now. There's Open three door. really, really big ones. What did you say? Open door. Open door. Sorry. Yeah. Open door, yeah. Zillow. And then uh, the last one, I can't remember right now. But what EXP is rolling out a platform called Express Offers. And okay. essentially, they're going to be offering a very similar service through a brokerage. So in my mind, it's a tool. It's just another tool in yeah. my tool belt so that when I show up, for, to meet with somebody, if, if it's the kind of house that I know I can't just go throw on the MLS, then I have that tool available to them. Yeah. And the cool thing now with eXp is I can do it right through my brokerage. I can, I go through all the disclosures with them and I say, okay, if you're interested, here's a link, go in there, fill all that out, put in your information and we will generate an offer for you. Now I don't have to go now, try to find cash buyers and things like that. So it's really, really yeah. cool. So yeah. that's something that's coming, coming down the road. So I'm actually in the process right now of getting certified to be an express offers agent. I'm doing it actually right now. I was, I spent about 30 minutes studying this morning. So um, I'm excited about that. Do you feel like the sales is the sales process or the techniques you're using in your business? Is it different with that kind of an offer? Do you have to Absolutely. adjust your approach? Okay. Um, I mean, I, I, I obviously, it depends who I'm talking to, right? Okay. Um, it, you know, I'm talking to a, a seller who has a, a you know, a $500,000 house and they're looking to downsize and they want to get into a car. That, that's not a conversation we're going to be having, right? Sure. Somebody registers for a home evaluation on my website and, you know, their home's worth 180000 I take a look at it. They need a kitchen, bathrooms, a roof. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's yeah. somebody that that may be a better option for, right? Or somebody they're behind on their mortgage four months and you know they want to avoid foreclosure. They still got some equity in their house. That's yeah. somebody that we're going to talk. It's the same thing as when I was doing short sure. sales. Same yeah. thing as REOs. So I, I want to come in and um, I'm an advisor. You know what? Here's based on your situation, here are the options. And yeah. you know, that might not, it's probably not the right option for a lot of people. Same thing with wholesaling. Wholesaling, 
is not – so right now I've got about seven or eight wholesaling potential people. Um, the one thing I didn't expect with wholesaling is it, it, the process is just like anything else. There's a lot of follow-up involved. There's a lot of nurturing involved. There's a, yeah. so, you know, I've got about seven or eight people that have homes that are just kind of watching the market right now. Yeah. And I think at some point they'll pull the trigger and, and they're going to call me, whether it's to do a wholesale or some of them, we just put it on the market. It sure. makes more sense for them to put it on the market and, and we'll market it through the MLS and we'll get them more money yeah. because the yeah. house warrants that. Yep. You mentioned earlier, and I wanted to say, I may be crazy, but this is what I think is going to happen. You are not crazy. I've talked to a lot of folks, a lot of smart guys like you who've been around for a while. I have yet to find anybody who's been in this industry for any length of time that doesn't 100% think we're heading for a correction of some kind, yeah. a downturn. Some people swear it's going to be worse than 08. Some people swear it's not going to be as bad, but everyone agrees something's happening. So I think you're totally right. And I think, you know, people ask me a lot, like, how, how's the market? How's real estate? It's like, it's, it's great. It's just, yeah. you have to know what, what phrase, phase, what, what cycle of the market you're in and adjust to it. And if, like you just said, right, every, when you got in and, and over the years, you just adjusted, you went from doing you know, short sales to this, to pre-foreclosures, whatever, like you just change with, you move with the cheese, so to speak, right? Like you change yeah. based off of what the conditions are and there's nothing, the market is not neither, it's neither good nor bad. It's just what it is. And if you have to make the adjustments. So yeah, I think that's, that's fantastic. Um, let's talk about, we mentioned your book, the sales playbook. And like we said, you know, accountability, as you listen to this, he said he'd have a back on Amazon. So you can go and check that out and grab that book. <laughs> Um, I love it. Other, I love it, man. The, the other thing is your uh, the Path to Mastery podcast. Uh, we chatted for a minute before we hopped on here live. Uh, one thing that stood out to me, I'm, I'm a Gary Vee fan. I, I spoke at Agent 2021, by the way. I was there. I spoke. Oh, awesome. Um, is that, you know, you, you showed up there and, and through some series of events, you got Gary on your podcast, which was total. I wasn't able to finagle that. So uh, hats off to you, man. I, I appreciate the, the, uh, the, the hustle on that one. Uh, but you've had some big guests on there. Why did you start the podcast? What what was the the reason behind that? And and what if how's that you know that experience been for you? Um, yeah, it's been amazing, man. It the podcast has uh, has been awesome. You know, I, Gary, uh, yeah, having Gary on was a big goal of mine. So I followed him around for a while. I think it's episode. I was trying to find out what I don't remember what episode it is. That it's yeah. I just do you remember? The, I think out. it might I be episode one thirteen. Okay. It's either, I think, no, I'm sorry. Episode 121 is the okay. episode that will tell you how I got Gary on the podcast. Yeah. Um, yep. But yeah, the, I love the podcast. It's been fun. The reason I started it was because I wanted to promote this thing, um, this book. And okay. I thought, hey, that'd be a great way to do that. And then, and honestly, I ended up falling in love with podcasting and <laughs> it's uh, it's just been amazing. It's opened up a yeah. lot of doors. It's created a lot of relationships. Like I said, I have Mel Robbins' phone number. I have Chris Voss's phone number. Chris Voss has been on twice. Yeah. Um. You know, John Acuff. Yeah. 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 He's his yeah. his stuff is phenomenal. I mean, I still yeah. use a quote of Chris Voss's every day. And uh, and and uh, for your listeners, we got to slow down to speed up. I say, I swear to God, I say that every day at some, in some Explain capacity. That. What does that mean? We have to slow down the speed up. Man, it's just life. I think just in life, you, you know, I think I'm always going so fast, man. Rushing here, rushing there. I got I to gotta rush to get this email out. So I, I rush to get it out. And then I, I make an error in the email or yeah. grammatical or something doesn't go right. So then the email bombs, right? Or, yeah. Yeah. or I'm rushing to get to here so that I can make sure I get on time to where I'm going, but I get pulled over. You know, it's just all these little things, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm rushing through my house so I don't get to spend any time and be present with my kids in the morning while they're getting ready to, for school. Cause I got to rush up to get to my office so that I make sure I, I get my studying in for the, it's, you know, that's life. I think like we're rushing, I'm assuming for myself and I think a lot of yeah. people will relate, but it's almost like I'm rushing to life through life to get to what's next. Like, Yep. It's always about like, what's next? Like, this is where I got to get, this is where, this is where I'm up to instead of just slowing down and, and, um, and being present, you know, and I think the slow down to speed up is it's all those areas, man. I just, yeah. I love that quote. It's something that I seriously say almost on a daily basis. Maybe not every day, but a couple times a week, I'll, I'll remember that quote from Chris. Chris yeah. shared that with me. 
I love it. Had a meeting today with some folks on my team and, and we had a very similar conversation, which was me saying, I have to quit saying yes to everything. I mm. need to slow down. I need to start prioritizing. I'm doing too much and I'm, nothing is being done at a high level. So I need to, I need to remember that quote myself. And like I said, Amen. it's very timely because I just had this conversation with my team and said, you guys have to help me keep me accountable. I'm not starting any more businesses for a while. Like I've got to, yeah. I've got to focus a little bit. So man, listen, it, it is, I'm not going to take up your whole day. I really appreciate you taking the time. I love talking to folks because listen, sales is your thing and sales permeates every bit of our life, not just business, any business you're in life itself. Um, and the messages of, of slowing down to speed up. It, it's so important, especially for entrepreneurs. Like I don't care what industry you're in. If you're an entrepreneur, you run your business, whatever that mean that should speak to you because I can almost guarantee you're running around like crazy trying to do things and, and you're making mistakes and you need to slow down a little bit. So people go and get the sales playbook on Amazon. It is currently there waiting for you. And uh, the path, to, I'm just, I'm really giving them a hard time with this book. Yeah, no, sure it's, it's hey, you just, it's, it has to get done now. That's it. It has, it to, has get to get done. done. And the path to, to mastery done. podcast, um, you know, all the luck on that. You've had some incredible guests and, and you've not done it. Uh, by just like, you know, sending a, a, an email or having your assistant send an email, like you've, you've worked your butt off to get some good people on there and that shows that you care. And that's awesome. Thank you, man. I, think it's very, I appreciate very cool. that. It, it, I'm know, so excited. I, I, I think you're going to be on, right? And we, why aren't we on like in the next day or so, right? So I'm yeah, excited about tomorrow, getting you actually. on. I'm going to be right. on there tomorrow. So I've got, Sweet. I've got some huge shoes. I'm now nervous. I've got some huge <laughs> shoes, but it, it shows be that you fine, care. Dude. Yeah, man, I, I'm looking forward to it. I can tell you're you're gonna you're an awesome host, and I've listened to some of your episodes because you make you know I interview a lot of people, and some people have podcasts. I, I rarely listen to like multiple episodes because I want to get a sense, but like I don't have tons of time. We just talked about I'm running around all the time. Sure. With you, I went and did some real deep investigation. I listened to a few episodes. I Thank wanted you, to man. hear what you were about, and and I, I loved it. I, you're great at it. So, it's a great what, what? Let me ask you this then. Now, what? What do you think? What did I do well? So, I want to know what I did. What? Because I'm always looking for feedback. I want to be better. I, what you did? What you did well that struck me? I'll tell you exactly. One thing that struck me when I listened to it is you did tell stories. Like it wasn't like you know, hello, I'm David and I have a guest on and here's my guest. And oh, I hope you guys enjoyed that. See you next time. Right. Like you, you told stories. Like I, I wasn't planning on listening to the whole story about Gary Vee. I just wanted to get the clip notes of how you got him on, but you tell a good story. So I was sitting there listening going, oh man, oh, that's awesome. And you sucked me right in with the whole story. And I, I stuck around for the whole thing because I was, it was curious. Well, so thank you, man. telling, telling stories is, is just great practice and anything, but you're really good at it. And it made your podcast so much more engaging than a lot of podcasts that I hear. So I, I would say, I keep appreciate that. that. Boy, if there's great. one thing I can do better, what would you say it would be? Some of it wasn't your fault because you were, you were hustling to get Gary V on, but I'm, I'm a big audio guy. I'm huge on audio. I think mm. I've listened to podcasts before where they, they were in it. They were clearly in their element. They weren't on location trying to get an interview from somebody huge and their audio was horrible. And I just turned it off because I can't listen to bad audio. Um, sure. So in the ones that I listened to, you happen to be kind of like on the move and getting someone who probably was next to impossible to get. Well, Gary was on it. a cell phone. Yeah. Yeah. You can't go, Hey, if you don't have a microphone or a, a good <laughs> mic, I'm not going to interview you. Right. Like you do sure. what you can do. So the ones I listened to, it's not a great representation because you were, you were hustling to get somebody huge. Um, but that's Fair always enough. a big thing for me is, is audio quality is always a big deal for me. Okay. I'll tell you one thing I'm always focused on is, is getting better at, at listening and asking questions. And, and what I'll do is I'll listen to my podcast after, and then I'll, I'll listen to it from a perspective of, of, of a listener. And then whenever I think I want to know the answer to that, I need to like, if I didn't ask the question, I missed something. Right. So when somebody makes a comment and my first thought is, I want to know the answer. Now, did I ask a question? Like, tell yeah. me more about that. Yeah. And, and it, it, it doesn't happen all the time, but it still happens. And that, yep. to me, that's, that's mastery. That's yep. the next level where none of those things ever, ever get through. Totally. And, and I think, you know, and now we're like getting into the art of podcasting here. So I don't know if we're losing people, but I don't care. It's a good, good conversation. <laughs> Sorry, man. I, I, no, no, man. I think it's good. I, I would cut it off. I didn't, but so I think you're right. Sometimes people are so ready to ask the next question. They're not listening to the answer they're getting. Mm. And if they listen to the answer they're getting, 
they would realize intuitively that there is a follow-up question that you need to ask. Sometimes people throw something out there and it's like, oh, I just know the next question and they get done with their answer and you go, that's great. And then you just go to the next thing. It's like, yeah. everyone is thinking, what about this last thing he just said? I hear that all more, the time. Right? Yeah, yeah, so it's it, you're right. As an, as someone who interviews, forget interviewing for a minute. If you're in sales and you're in someone's home and you're talking to them about their house and listing it or buying it, and you just know what you're trying to get out of them, and you're just fire, you're not listening. You're gonna miss it. Sometimes people will tell you what the pain point is and what they really want help with, and it's not always yeah. the cost or what you're ever gonna offer them for their house. It could be something else. But if you're not actively listening to them you could miss the sale because you're not paying attention. You're not engaged 100%. in what they're saying. So it's a good life lesson, man. Forget podcasting. It's just good in life. Your kids, your wife, like listen to what they're saying. Like slow down, right? Slow down. Don't mm -hmm. worry about what your next agenda is. Listen to what's happening in front of you. So, Amen. Yeah. And doing this has made me better at sales. It really has even, it's even brought my game up a little bit. Uh, yeah. Or maybe a lot of it. <laughs> yep. you no, know, I, so. could, I could understand how that could be, man. Well, listen, you're awesome. Tons of good stuff here. And you've obviously got tons of knowledge. You've been doing this a long time. Great salesperson. You've, we haven't even hit all of your accomplishments, but uh, I touched on them in, in when I introed you in the beginning. Um, best of luck to you in, in, in going forward and everything you're doing. I know you'll be great when you get that wholesaling arm going. I, I'm sure you'll be awesome at that. Continued success in all you're doing. Good luck on these huge guests that you're so able to get. Thank you. And one final question. What's level jumping? Level jumping. Good. I'll explain that in detail to you when I'm on your show. But level jumping is the book I wrote. And it has to do with how do you people talk about going to the next level, right? I'm going to take my business to the next level. Mm. And I think you can sometimes go to the next level on your own. But for me, surrounding myself with the right people, surrounding myself with people whose game is a little beyond mine, and, and understanding what did they do? I, you know, I, I a few years back, I really started being focused on, you know, the five, you know, you're the average of the sum of the five people you surround yourself with. I started surrounding myself with a higher classification of, of, of business people and just people in general. And so by talking to them about what they did in their business to get where they are, the things they did right and the things they did wrong, I was able to not just go to the next level, but I was able to what I call level jump. I skipped levels. You know, when you were a kid mm. and you'd go up the stairs and you'd go two at a time to get yeah, faster. Yeah, yeah. That's what I think you can do in That's business. Cool. If you surround yourself with the right people and ask the right questions, you can skip levels. You can actually go from here. You don't have to go to the next level, go to the next, next level. And that's what I think people can and should be doing in their business. Well, I look forward to having that conversation. Um, and I am going to repurpose this episode. So that's why I asked you that. So how do people get a copy of this book? They can go right to Amazon, man. My book's on Amazon right now. Oh, I self-published right from the beginning. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> Not to rub awesome. it in, no. Yeah, That's I went awesome. right from the beginning. I went to Amazon. So they can go there and get it. I think I'm going to give your folks when I'm on, if you're okay with it, I'm going to give them a way they can get that book for free even. So awesome. uh, we'll talk about that when I, when I do your show. But man, thanks for doing this. I really appreciate it. I appreciate your time. Continued yeah. success in all you do. And I can't wait to talk to you tomorrow.